Yes, today's shear is going to be our last one for a couple of weeks as we'll recess for three weeks, take my family to America a little bit. That's part of the conditions of living in Eretz Yisrael, you know, part of the deal of Aliyah. It's an Aliyah expense. Anyway, it should be for good. I, um, we're going to wrap up the book of Bamidbar and the, as we transition to Sefer Dvarim. And uh, mm-hmm. there's a lot, a lot that we need to discuss, and I'm going to try to do it as simply and as clearly as possible. And it centers around the final events that Moshe encounters of his career, really. Because once we get into the book of Devarim, what's going on at that point? It's going to be the black we have in six weeks or something like that. And his actions as a leader of the Jewish people it's his final act, is the act of the tochacha and the brachos and everything that he gave Kal Yisrael from that last time period, which, uh, as we learned from Sefer Dvarim, which is this week's Parsha, Parsha's Chazon, we began teaching what, di- what day of the calendar year did he start to teach? Shvat, Rosh Chodesh Shvat. And when does... Moshe passed away. Zainadar. Okay. So it's just a little over a month, a month and a week. And that's that discourse of the entire... Sorry. That's the entire discourse of um, Sefer Dvarim. With all of its mitzvot and with all of its um, preparations that Moshe gave to them. But I would like to say the good news is that at the very end of the book of Bamidbar, mm. Kalal Yisrael takes a major step forward. And it demonstrates as the new generation that it's prepared to heed Moshe Rabbeinu's word successfully, including the transition to a smooth transition of power from Moshe to Yehoshua, which is included in that. But not only that, but other leaders have emerged. Who else, who are the other two key figures who will usher in Kalal Yisrael to begin the war against the Sheva Amamim, the 31 Canaanite kings? Elazar is the new Kohen Gadol, plus another very, 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 and Pinchas, whose role is what? What is Pinchas' job officially? He's the Kohen Mashuach Milchama. Now, the halacha is, and we learn this again at the very end of the book of Bamidbar, there's a law that involves the Kohen Meshuach Melchama, not only as someone who leads them into war, but somebody who has a capacity equal to the Kohen Gadol. And what is that? Well, we learned the laws of Ir Miklot. There were six Ir Miklots. In addition to that, 48 cities of Kohanim, uh, of Leviim. Again, all from the end of the book, uh, for all from Matos Mase, from Bolak, Pinchas, Pinchas, Matos Mase. This is the capstone. I like to call it the capstone of, of the years of the Midbar, saying that now we are prepared to leave the Midbar. So it's all good news. It's not just the end of a story, it's a transformation. Now, what is this transformation? Let's try to understand a little bit. It's composed of a few things. Setting up your miklot, a new census, which included Levi as a mate, which is interesting. There were the 12,000 soldiers that were tasked to, t- to take on the battle of Midian, Milchemes Midian, which, as we'll see in a moment, was unlike any war that they had ever participated in or would ever participate in. And then we have this tremendously detailed accounting of the spoils of war and even a little debate between Moshe, a little bit of a heated debate between Moshe Rabbeinu and even Pinchas and the Roshe Matot. What was the debate? What was Moshe upset about? All the adult women, i.e. all the women who could have participated in a sin, they were old enough to have relations, even if they didn't. 
Moshe says, why didn't you kill them? And we have to understand, why did they deserve death? So, so let's just uh, take it one step at a time. That the, the premise is that what happens here at the very end of Amidbar is, is really a hachana to receive Moshe's words and carry them out. So it's not Klal Yisrael just wandering aimlessly in the Midbar and uh, until we get to Eretz Yisrael. No. They had to go through a preparatory stage, a successful training, as it were. It's a training program for the new generation. And were they successful? Tell me, were they successful, yes or no? Tremendously successful. And who was the key person in that success? Well, two more individuals that we didn't mention. Who leads them? Yoshua and... And Kalev is also a key figure. So here's what's going on. We put the pieces together. We'll have to analyze the War of Midian because this was really, really all about something different than you would ever expect. Okay, so now, let's break it apart. There are two types of wars that Kalev Yisrael fight once they enter Eretz Yisrael. Does anybody know what they're called? One is called the Melchemes Mitzvah. And one is called a Melchemes Rishus. What's the difference between them? The Melchemes Mitzvah is against whom? Is against whom? The seven Amamim, the seven Canaanite nations. With a Malek being an extension of that. They didn't have to encounter the Malek. Actually, who's the person that finally takes on a Malek? Not so much later. Who's the, who's, who are the two individuals, the three individuals, to take on a Amalek successfully, finally, Shmuel, Shaul, and David Amalek. So we don't even get to Amalek just yet. But the, what's the difference between a Melchemes Mitzvah and a Melchemes Rishos? So let's look at the Rambam, for example. The Rambam in the Hilchos, Melachim, Umilchem Oseihem, Perek Vav, says like this. It's a very interesting shita. His shita is, everybody gets a chance to be good. Right? Um, Who says it? The Rambam. Hilchos Malachim, the laws of the kings, and, his, and their wars, Perak Vav, at the end of Shoftim, which also contains the laws of Mashiach, which is very interesting and about the whole Messianic era. But here's a practical thing about what actually happened historically and what the din is. If you go into Eretz Yisrael and you encounter the seven Amamim, what do you do? First thing you do. First thing. Offer them, offer them peace. Right? Moshe's, Moshe offers peace. He offered peace also to Sichon and Oak, correct? And what does it mean? If they accept, if they capitulate. They have to accept also, uh, accept correct. Very good. That's what the Ram exactly says. He says, Vimlo shlimu. Let's say they don't want to they don't want to make peace. Oh, Shehe Shlimu, they'll say we will 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 not attack you. We'll be at peace with you. However, Lo kibalu sheva mitzvos. We're going to live in Eretz Yisrael and we're going to do whatever we please. We'll continue with Avodah Zarah. We'll continue with Ritzicha. We'll continue with Arayos that are relevant to Bnei Noach, stealing, etc. No court system. We're going to just be without rule of law of Torah. Without a Torah rule. Can you let them stay in Eretz Yisrael under those conditions? No. Says the Rambam. O simi mohem milchama. Who do you kill? So be careful. Listen, listen carefully. Listen carefully to the Rambam because it's a little, a little tricky. Vehargin kol hazecharim hagadolim. We do away with all adult males. How much is an adult male? To question whether a non-Jew is considered an adult at thirteen or at nine or younger. Okay, but let's whatever the halacha of adult for an, what? No, he just says hagadolim. What does gadolim mean? So we have a, you know, a physical marking of that they reach the puberty stage, right? They demonstrate that. Okay. It's a question a little bit, at what age does a non-Jew come of age? We know bar mitzvah for a Jew. Mm -hmm. For a non-Jew, it may be a little slightly different. Can't you drive them out also, instead of killing them? Well, yes. You, you leave them an avenue for escape. You can, they, they can always escape. You let them go. Baruch HaTorah Adonai the only problem is if they want to remain. So, ubozazim kol mamonam vitapam, and all the money and all of the children, male or female, 
you can keep for yourself. That's considered of an Eved. It's a material possession. Ve'ein hargin isha. You're not allowed to kill the women. Ve'lo katan. Shenemar v'hanoshim v'hataf. Zetaf shel scharim. Meaning, says the Rambam, you are not allowed to kill the adult women and you're not allowed to kill the young boys. They also are part of the conquest. So what happens to the women? They're adult women. What are you going to do with them? Well, the, if they accept Gerus, then they could be Jewish and marry mm-hmm. Jews. Is this about the above um, Not exactly, because we'll, we'll, be, we'll get that in a second. Um, or they're going to become what we call an Ama, uh, a Shifcha Kananis. A Shifcha Kananis is the in-between stage. They're not quite Jewish. They're not, not Jewish. They keep mitzvos, certain mitzvos, <clears throat> but um, they are obligated, um, but they are not fully Jewish until they are released from captivity. At that point, they become a Gioras, and you can do, and she can be like any other Gioras, okay? And there's a whole, if she doesn't want to go through that process, then we actually can, she can actually be released. If she doesn't want to become Jewish, okay, then we allow her to go home to her family. That's by Yafas Toar. Over, that's by Yafas Toar. Here, here, one second. Here, all it says is that we don't kill. Now, let's go further in the Rambam. Everything I just told you, is in an optional war. What's an optional, optional war? They need to expand the boundaries of Eretz Yisrael. Why do they need to extend the boundaries of Eretz Yisrael? A, Eretz Yisrael is growing in population. B, there are resources that are needed there, right? And I'm going to take it one step further. They're on the biblical land promised to Avram Avinu, even though it's not the land of the seven Canaanite nations or they're not members of the seven Canaanite nations, and they just happen to be in town. Okay? So here's a very important distinction, and it was actually at the end of last week's Parsha, and I'm cutting to the chase because it's, we're on a time clock, but there are two Yerushos that Hashem gives to Eretz Yisrael, and we've spoken about this on different occasions. One is the land of the seven nations. That's called Eretz Canaan. The specific boundaries of Eretz Canaan are given in last week's Parsha, Matos Masse. Right? They basically go from, at minimum, El Arish, or as much as to the Nile, across the desert to um, the Dead Sea, maybe as far down as a lot, maybe not, according to most poskim, which is why during Shemitah year, you're allowed to buy produce from just outside of a lot. But if you go a little bit more north, then everybody agrees that that was part of the Eretz Canaan original Yerusha. Um, and then it goes up the Yardane and all the way up to the, um, <clears throat> to the north, but certainly not past, um, not much past what we would call the Golan, and then swings around to the left and ends up in, a nor- you know, in the northern part, of, um, northern part <laughs> of the country till you get to the Mediterranean. That's called Eretz Canaan. Oh. Damascus is in there, though. No. Nope. Damascus is not in there. Damascus is not in there. And one of the, one of the, one of the precursors to that is that, that Avram fought only up until Damascus, but didn't conquer Damascus. That was a, single, uh, a signal. However, so have, somebody asked a question. I'm sorry. Yeah, doesn't that include part of today's Lebanon? Yes. Or most of it? Yes. Now, there's a Nahar Gadol Nahar Pras means, in this context, the very northern tip of the Euphrates, which is in that northern Syria, not far from their place. You'll see, it's like as you go, if you look at the map, and there's a beautiful Dat Mikra atlas, which I encourage you to get. I actually have pictures on my phone. If you really want me, I can send it out. I can send it to you. I'll send it to the class. I took pictures of the, of, the, of the pages of the atlas. Very interesting. But without getting into too much detail, it's a smaller Yerusha than 
the land of the ten nations. Who are the ten nations? That's Averliardain, on the other side of the Jordan, and it includes the lands of three primary nations, Ammon, Moab, and Edom. Where's Midian fallen over there? Not really. But Midian is located down where Edom is. In fact, that's the big chiddush of this Melchemist Midian that you're going to find out, that it is a hybrid Melchama. They're not quite the seven nations, right? And they're not quite Amalek, Edom, but they're close. They're somewhere in the middle. It's a very unique situation, and we're going to try his best to explain what the significance of Midian versus everybody else is in, in the context of finishing Book, book of Midbar, okay? And getting ready for, uh, really, for coming into Eretz Yisrael. Okay, so now let's talk what the Ramah says about the, the, what we call Melchemes Mitzvah. So again, we established that in a Melchemes Rishus, who stays alive? Who stays alive in a Melchemes Rishus? The adult women the adult boy, the, 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 the minor boys, as well as the minor girls, of course, all alive. And what do you do with the money? Keep it. What happens in the Melchemist Mitzvah, however? And the Rambam says, beautifully, links them together with Amalek. Aval shima shiva amamim ve'amalek, because Amalek is an honorary member of the shiva amamim. Okay, <laughs> it's, which is interesting, but we'll see. Shelohi shlimu, if they refuse to make peace, ein meinichin mehem nishama. Everybody goes. Shenemar kein tase lecholarim v'chula v'chula, and lo tichaye kol nishama. There is no human uh, being that's allowed to remain alive. V'chein hu omer ba malek timche es zecher amalek. We do not say that adult women stay alive. We do not say that young boys stay alive. We do not say that young girls who are below the age of maturity stay alive. Everybody's gone. What about the shalal? Hmm? He doesn't talk about the shalal here, but we know that when Shaul HaMelech was given the, the din, right? right, he was told... Now, now you really understand, you know, how complicated it is because, you know, there is a thought, I mean, that even in a Melchama, in, in a Melchama that you, you keep the money. So again, uh, that was an argument that Shaul fell prey to, but it has a special din of Lo Tuchaye Kol Neshama, and, and, and Shaul was told to make everything, as they say in Arabic, Haram, wipe it out. Wipe it out, Asur. So now let's look at Mechemes Midian. What do you think? Which one does it match? Does it match Mechemes Rishus or does it match Mechemes Shiva Amalek? Which one does it match? Yes. Neither. Can you explain why? What, what, what's not the match? What, did they, what was their commandment? Moshe Rabbeinu said you're supposed to kill all the women and you're supposed to kill all the young boys and the only ones you can keep alive are the young girls. So which one is it more like? You, it, it looks like Melchemist Mitzvah, but there's one difference. There's two major differences. A, you keep the girl, the young girls, the ones that are below uh, the age that they could have participated in the sin, in the Eitzas Bilam, and also all the money. And not only that, but the Torah goes out of its way to tell us exactly how much money was taxed it was actually the same model as truma. How much truma do you give when you get produce? One, well, that's meiser is a tenth. Truma is one out of 50. And that's what they say that the 12,000 uh, soldiers, 1,000 from each tribe, actually represented a 50th of all the potential warriors. So it's truma. So it's interesting that the mochama, this mochama, has a similar rule to income tax. They were battling the IRS. Good luck good to you. What? Unless you have a good lawyer. Unless you have a good uh, a Jewish accountant. They say that Trump uh, was uh, sad, you know, because he always had 
business with Jews in the real estate, you know, he would. So he says, whenever it comes to the numbers, get the guys with the beanies. The guys with the beanies. Those are the only guys. When it comes to accounting, don't trust anybody else. Mm. So, so what is going on over here? First of all, it's modeled after a model of Truma and then the Levium get their, their portion. And it's just like if I would go out and do business and make money, I would have to share. What does Midian have to do with making money and business? It's like, what is that all about? And why was it in a comma? It was in a comma for Moshe Rabbeinu. It seems like it's a, Moshe has a personal issue to settle with Midian. Does he have a personal issue with Midian? Generally? Yeah, his wife is from Midian. Kohen, uh, uh, Midian was his father-in-law, Yisro. He's got a whole parsha named after Yisro. And something... He was like, yeah, well, he was, I mean, Yisrael was like the king. He was like the king. Not in Midjan. He was a king in, actually, in Africa, in uh, Kush, Ethiopia, king of Ethiopia, according to the Midrash. Okay, now, so what, what in the world is going on over here? What, what is this all about? If it's a Mohammed's Rishus, leave the women alive. If it's a Mohammed's Mitzvah, kill everybody. What is this business? Kill the little boys, but not the little girls, and keep the money and give mice and chuma. It doesn't seem to match any model that we're familiar with at all. And yet, it becomes the main focus of the preparation for Kalal Yisrael to enter Eretz Yisrael, I will argue, because look at the great detail that it's given at the end of uh, end of Book of Midbar. It's so critical. It's so important. And who does Hashem, who does Moshe Rabbeinu, instruct to go to make sure that everything is going to be kosher, as we said last time. Who is sent? The Kohen Gadol? Pinchas. But you know, Pinchas doesn't go without his equipment. What equipment is he sent with? That actually becomes the key thing for him to know who to kill and who to keep alive. That sits. He gets to borrow the halachos, the, 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 the personal gear of the Kohen Gadol. That is very strange. Pinchas is not a Kohen Gadol, but now, how, now you can understand why when somebody kills accidentally and goes to where? An ear miklat. He stays there how long? The Kohen Gadol dies. So in the Mishnah, there's an opinion that says, Af meshuach milchama machzir because he's a quasi Kohen Gadol. He's the Kohen Gadol that goes to war. Most Kohen Gadols cannot go to war because if they actually... They're risking what? What are they risking? To become Tame. And, and even they ask about Pinchas. He did something that should have made him Tame. What did he do that should have made him Tame? So they say that they were still alive when he carried them out on the sword. And then when he let go of them, they died. Now, Pinchas wearing the tzitz... They brought him, after Moshe's command, every single woman, and what happened? In front of the tzitz, if her face turned green, she was dead. It, all the Midianite women. And then, if not, she stayed alive. And that was just to determine the, the not that they actually didn't avail or not, but just had they reached the physical maturity that they could have even participated in Avera. So we're talking about girls that are three years old? Three-year-old, basically, infants. Babies, toddlers, whatever you call them. They yeah, killed them. Anyone that was physically mature, gone. An incredible, an incredible thing. But he killed more than one person. Yeah, but well, he didn't actually kill them because um, he couldn't kill them. He would become Tommy. Even if you kill a, a goy, right, a dead goy, when you touch a dead goy, you're going to become, you, ki- you, you touch the sword that kills, it would become Tame. So there is tumor that, that's susceptible, so he couldn't kill them, but he identified the ones that need to be killed. to determine who should be killed. How did they know 
which Jews deserve to die at Baal Peor. And as we said last week, most of them got off the hook, or at least got off the hook at that moment. How do they know who was supposed to be killed? The, the Anan HaKavod would run away from them and the sun would shine on their face. So it's interesting, this Milchama, they use the tzitz. The other Milchama, it's the sun. Why can't we use the sun for this one or the tzitz for that one? Chazal, very specific. So we have to try to understand that too. Why was Pinchas there? Why was he wearing the tzitz? And why was he the one to determine which of the baby girls should survive? That's what's going on. No. The sun would shine on them, meaning that they weren't covered by the clouds of protection, and therefore out. They're, they high of Misa. And it does seem, we spoke about this last week, that they were, were actually meant to be stoned and hung, because that's the halacha. Kol haniskalim nitlin. It's a machlokas, actually, which ones, but certainly um, people like Megadev and Obed of Odezara would be stoned and hung. Stone doesn't mean stoned per se. It means they were thrown off a cliff, a high, uh, and, then, and then if they were still alive, they would then stone. But, um, but it doesn't seem like they did, as we said last week, because Pinchas comes in and saves the day. Just like any good Kohen Gadol comes in, right? And, spare, and he's, he's the guy that gets that murderer off the hook. He's a great guy. He takes the hit. He, he takes responsibility for them. Let's put it that way. Okay. So let's try, try to explain. In order to understand this, we have to go a little further into Tanakh and understand something about Midian. Midian has one major, major role to play, and it's pretty much at the very beginning when Klal Yisrael come into Eretz Yisrael after the death of Yehoshua. That's, diff- that's something different. Now, I'm referring to Sefer Shoftim, and it starts with Perak Vav. So you could go take a look. It's worthwhile. Just read a couple of prokim. It starts, Vayasu b'nei Yisrael hara b'nei Hashem, Vayitnem Hashem b'yad Midyan sheva shanim. They spent seven years under the tyrannical rule of Midyan. Vata'az yad Midyan al Yisrael. Mipnei Midyan asu lahem b'nei Yisrael es minharos asher baharim ves maros ves mitzados. They made them build, um, they, you know, they made them slaves to build. Right? Now, the haya im zeri Yisrael, the ola midyon, the amolek u b'nei kedem alolov. Guess who the partner is? Amolek. Midyon is like in between a Milchemes Rishus and a Milchemes Amalek. It's very close to Milchemes. It has elements of Milchemes Amalek. Well, uh-huh. That is another good question, but I don't have an answer to that at the moment. But there certainly were. Maybe that's why they needed a Amalek to help them out because they weren't very numerous. But they were very... Which I, I'll tell you what I think. It was titular Midian, but practically a Malik in Eretz Benekedim. In other words, sometimes you put up a king and you say, you know, like, like Lahavdil Assad is the king of Syria, right? What is his role? I mean, who's really calling the I mean, is he really the king of anything? You know what I'm saying? Who knows what he is? But there are forces that are running the show, like Russia and Iran and who knows what. But they put up a king. This is always how it was. By, by the way, even I was reading in Josephus. I always like to read a little Josephus around the time of Tisha B'av because you get the real story of the Chorban, the real story about exactly what happened with the Romans and all the politics and what was going on. And so, they, they know, in the Roman period, towards the end of the Beis Migdash, they had a king, Agrippus, Agrippus HaMelech, is Rechov Agrippus. But Lamaisa, Rome, was in charge. But they would allow the local king. It was like the story I told you about King Muhammad V of Morocco who saved the Jews from the Nazis. He was king, but he wasn't king. He was king because the people loved him and that was their ethnicity and that's their tradition and that's who they wanted to be their king. But there were other forces at play. I believe that this 
clearly was one of those, because not just Midian, it's Amalek, it's Bnei Kedem, Bnei Kedem are the people from the further east, that's Assyria, that's Iraq, that's other people. Well, again, they, we got some, enough to put, them, put up a good front anyway. It says, How's that sound familiar? They destroyed the produce close to Aza. How is that? Velo yashiru michya bi Israel. They didn't let the Jews have food. Visev ashur vechamor. Kihem umikneam yalu. Veloheam yavo. Kide arbe la rov lahem vlegmalehem ein mispar. They came with all their camels. And they, they took everything. What was their purpose? To destroy the land of Israel. They didn't even want the land of Israel. They just wanted to destroy it. Gee, does that sound familiar? And what was the, what was the, the, the animal that they were riding? Where do camels come from? Do you ever see camels running up here in Israel? No, no, no. You've got to be in the desert. They are, these are Yishmaelim. Yishmaelim? being used as a front for a Molech. Does that sound familiar also today? Now, Ishmaelim are being presented. What's that? I'm just explaining that Midian was the front of this seven-year war to destroy Israel. But look, to destroy the economy, to destroy the financial viability just like they're throwing the balloons, the helium balloons, and destroying Meshech. Just destroy it. Just burn it to the ground. And wait. Unfortunately, they ain't done yet. We've got to get through this period of Tisha B'Av, which is all about what? Eish Tukad Bekirbi. Eish Tukad Bekirbi. It's about fire. Rabbi Nachman speaks about Maori Or and Maori Eish. Maori Or is a spiritual light. Maori Eish is physical destruction. They're very close. One represents Rome, represents Yerushalayim. Yerushalayim is the city of Or. Rome is the city of Aish. So they do good. They're very good at destroying, incinerating. And um, what does an atom bomb do but incinerate? It's just one big Aish. And um, what did baby Yishmael do, a young Yishmael do, when Yitzchak was born? What did he do? Shot arrows. They shot arrows. That's what they do. Yishmael can only do one thing. They're not very good with the swords. You know, with the metal stuff. But they're very good with fire. They can fire arrows. You know, flaming arrows. Blister out rockets and rocks. They're very, very good. It all started with rocks, right? The whole intifada was rocks. And then, of course, it, it continues to become more and more dangerous. So look what the Pasuk says here. Vayidal Yisrael ma'od mipnei minyan vayizaku b'nei Yisrael el Hashem. Yidal is from the word of ozer dalim hoshiyana. 